Hello, good afternoon. If you're here in the UK or in Europe, uh, good morning in the US and, and the rest of North America, and good evening in Taiwan and the rest of Asia. Um, very, very happy to have all of you with us today for our discussion uh, on Taiwan technology and trade. Uh, we've got three really distinguished panelists uh, who are going to give us some presentations and insights uh, on various aspects of both technological development, uh, high tech policy and regulation uh, and trade and political economy and the implications uh, of Taiwanese politics on those things and of those things on Taiwan, uh, economics, uh, politics and, and, and society. Uh, and so let's get started first. Uh, we have uh, Junyi Li, uh, who is Associate Professor of Politics at the University of Nottingham, uh, who's going to present first. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, I would like to share my PowerPoint first and see if the technology indeed help us on that. OK, so I guess that you can see what I would like to discuss, share my observations with you. Well, I've been given the trade technology in Taiwan, but I actually focus a little bit more on how Taiwan uh, manufacturing the semiconductor and all that complex of the geopolitics or cross trade relations in terms of the semiconductor manufacturing. So I might be a little bit deviate from the uh, generous uh, host. The, the, top, the title, but hopefully that uh, our audience will bear with me a little bit. And then we have two other distinguished speakers who will be more into the topic of the trade and uh, uh, technology regulation wise. So, well, this is a rather old and cliched discussion whether Taiwan is the most dangerous place on Earth. And I just quickly go through what are the semiconductors for the general audience interest and what is the global supply chain and uh, um, why I would say that TSMC is a Taiwan way of manufacturing, which I will explain consequently. And I will provide some other further thoughts for the other two uh, speakers that they would be able to pick up what I didn't mention or I didn't really go delved into. Um, to for all the audience to discuss in a little while. So to start with that, this is a very um, deeply embedded image to most of the Taiwan-China related readers audience mind. That is Economist cover in May 2020 of whether Taiwan is the most dangerous place on Earth. That is, of course, uh, start with all the visits of the Pelosi's visit uh, to Taiwan in 2020 August and was also subsequently of the um, President Tsai's visit uh, to the states and then all that actually doesn't help of Taiwan being a not dangerous place which was the presidential result in January this year which we had the DPP uh, candidate uh, President-elect Lai and the Vice President Xiaobi King won over the presidential election. Of course, uh, one may argue that they didn't actually win over all the uh, parliament's votes because it is kind of the hang cabinet so far in Taiwan. That is a different issue that if we would like to, I, would like, I could provide further thoughts on that. All of these uh, discussions we are capturing in the uh, academic blog Taiwan Insight. If you are interested in to have more of the information of the election, we could you could have to look into our Taiwan Insights uh, election special issue. But why did I mention all this um, Pelosi's visit or President Tsai's visit to the States or the current what just happened less than two months? Taiwan presidential election because all that actually make our big neighbor China quite uneasy. Fighter jets flew over of the median line wasn't a news. It's the frequency of the fighter jet flew over the median line or China already declared 
there wasn't a median light. It's its whole street is is of China's territory, and not to mention Taiwan. This little island is of is of China. So, what I've mentioned earlier of all that accumulative events, including the recent election, uh, president and the uh, parliament election in Taiwan, actually accumulate further of our big neighbor. Uh, China's anger, if you like, and uh, many um, spectators, observers uh, just have a very close watch to what China is doing or about to do. But actually, in the field of the semiconductor or technology, I would actually argue that Taiwan is the most desirable place on Earth, not exactly the most dangerous place on Earth because of the little chips that Taiwan uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing Company and the ecosystem has been provided to the global uh, semiconductor markets. And to our old, to our audience, uh, uh, just very quick information: TSMC has produced ninety percent of the most advanced chips in the global market, fifty-six percent of the global chips market, and of course, there are other Reveries, they are, for instance, Samsung, um, uh, but it's not really, um, uh, sorry, it's not really able to match up with the TSMC's uh, manufacturing strengths. And uh, in that sense, it's also a lot of the components that uh, in any daylight, well, in any modern lights, uh, uh, production, we will need the semiconductor. I just also just use the car as a, uh, as an example that all parts of the electric cars or not even electric cars, you need semiconductor. But of course, it is a difference between uh, advanced semiconductor or a legacy semiconductor. What I mentioned, the TSMC has been really the leading producer in the advanced semiconductors. Less, most of the advanced semiconductor is less than three nanometers. But of course, this kind of the car semiconductor you need is legacy semiconductor, which is much bigger than three nanometer, which other, other countries, for instance, China, probably is the most uh, strong producers of the legacy semiconductors. Um, so I quickly jump into the global supply chain due to the geopolitics complex that I mentioned earlier, and also, of course, the anger of uh, our big neighbor China towards Taiwan, that a lot of the country, especially since what we've seen, Russia invaded Ukraine, start to think that and also the shortage of the chip during the COVID time. Start to think that whether it's possible to make the semiconductors from beginning to end. It's not possible because that is a very complex of the global supply chain we are seeing now, which according to the OECD's definition, that is a network, a very complex network that cooperates, transform raw materials to finished goods and service for customers. So this complex supply chain actually connects suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, retail outlets, and customers. The reason we can enjoy, if I can use this word enjoy, of about 1,200 pounds uh, laptop of Mac Air so far, or Mac Pro, that is because of this close link semiconductor supply chain to make the price so cheap and controllable, acceptable to the customers. So this is very brief chat of the uh, components which are made in different countries. Of course, Taiwan only is part of the supply chain, although I would argue it's a key part of the supply chain. Americans are holding the designing part um, and also Japan, a company in Taiwan, also is manufacturing, but not, not really in terms of advanced chip manufacturing. Korea, as I mentioned, is a strong um, rivalry of TSMC, but they are manufacturing a different kind of the chips, which is memory chip, and uh, TSMC is manufacturing more of the logic chips. Uh, China, 
what we are worried about and most concerned about is also in the supply chain. But so far, their technology still stay in a rather lower level, which means that they can manufacturing semiconductor, but those manufacturing in China are still staying in a less advanced stage than what TSMC can do. Um, quickly, just to say that why TSMC has been really successful and what I want to mention is it's not just about this company of the TSMC, it's the whole ecosystem in Xinju Science Park in Taiwan, which has built uh, and ministered by the government in the 1980s and learned the knowledge or still learning the knowledge from the Silicon Valley. So the technology connection between Xinju Science Park and, and uh, Silicon Valley is, has been really strong. On the other hand, Taiwan and China are still linked in the production. So many of Taiwan's original equipment manufacturing factories in China still and still continuing to produce Chihuahua, this is what I called. So it is made by Taiwanese company in the Chinese territory, if you like. So what Taiwanese company has been good, including TSMC actually invested in Nanjing and Shanghai in 2016 and 2021. So Taiwan has still working with China and what Taiwanese company has been good to manufacturing those high-tech semiconductor because they have very good quality control and disciplined managements. Okay. TSMC has been the leading company in the supply chain, of course, and I was just mentioned about whether that is only one company. I don't think so because there's many satellite smaller companies working with the TSMC and supply all the TSMC needed. But also the government in Taiwan at the time of 1970s and 80s have been really instrumental to um, establish the Xinju Science Park and provide initial fund, for instance, for most of the tech companies, including TSMCs. And another point, if now we say Taiwan is not a, a country which has just one government, one party, we have alternative party, we are in a democracy, that's true. It's not a developmental state status, but what Taiwan still have is the resilience of a highly skilled workforce. And not just to mention that it's not only the high skilled, but also comparatively much cheaper labor price if you compare with American workers or if you compare with German workers, uh, Taiwanese high skill uh, engineers are much cheaper in price. Yeah. So those are the um, pictures that I took uh, when I was in Taiwan last year of the uh, research laboratory, which is to mimic what is really the situation of the clean room. And those kind of the clean suit, they called rapid suit, which they have to wear for at least 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours a day. Of course, they have a very high reward. Those are the high skill engineers, but the efforts and also the payoff is also quite huge. Um, that is coming to what I would say that I have some further thoughts, which probably we can discuss later. Because of the countries, they are thinking of whether Taiwan is safe to put all the eggs into this very dangerous but desirable little island. So you have seen that USA have the Chips and Science, Chips and Science Act and also European country EU has a, a Chips Act. Subsequently, last year, they all already announced uh, and you also saw TSMC has been encouraged strongly and already did to invest in the USA, Arizona and in Japan, Kumamoto and in Germany, uh, I think it's Dresden. But TSMC is not a state owned company. And another point is whether those investments will be able to run smoothly, less something we need to watch out because last year we already heard that a lot of the US uh, 
high skill workers had a lot of complaint because they say TSMC is very exploitative. TSMC does not allow them to have more of the breaks and the TSMC has very tasking on them. Those working cultures, what I just mentioned, not only about the price of Taiwanese labor, but also the working culture of the Taiwanese labor are very different to the US labor. So how exactly that can really be a very smooth investment? We don't know. Um, indeed, they are chips X in the USA, EU and the UK, but it's still there's no single country can manufacture in chips because you still need suppliers, you still need raw material, you still need the machine or equipments to uh, make the whole manufacturing of the chips successful. So it is a very iffy thought whether those huge investments on the chip acts, which cost all the taxpayers money of the US and EU, UK actually comparatively has much more smaller allowance on the chip act. So the question is whether those chip acts would be worthy to the taxpayers money. Then I come to the threat of China last summer, or I think that it was in September, August. Huawei also announced that they successfully developed seven nanometer chips. Wow. So it's still very be, be very difficult for China to break through if the technology development still follows more slow, which is every two years that exponentially would have a breakthrough. And uh, of course, it has been really difficult for China to innovate, especially on all Americans um, trade control. And not to mention that China has been really struggle if they if they want to to have their initiative of Made in China 2025 really work, which means that China does not want to rely on any external technology. They want to self-upgrade, they want to rely on their own technology. All that is a big question to China. So although encouragingly we've seen that Huawei has sort of announced their 7 nanometer chips, but I would say still it's a big question that whether China would be able to break through all this net that the West has been put on them. Well, I think there's the last question is whether all this like TSMC or the, the network that TSMC has been worked through, has been produced, would be able to share Taiwan to, to guard Taiwan's safety, if, if one would say. I would think that to some extent it's possible, but actually the US also acknowledge that China is not just that they can discard, although they still would say we wanted to decouple, but I think many of us have been witness that the tone of decouple has been toned down a little bit more to be a de-risk. So this report published last summer of the Silicon Triangle actually took China in, but of course the report by uh, the Hoover Institute is to say that it still wants very much to curb China in terms of their technology innovation. And I think I should leave there um, because I think my distinguished two other speakers will be able to point out all the errors that I've made in my talk. Great, thank you very much uh, for a really great presentation. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Monique Chu, uh, who is a lecturer in politics at the University of Southampton. Thank you, Bill, for having me. <clears throat> I've noticed that two of my students are in the audience. I hope I won't let them down. So Trang has uh, given a very good general overview of the issues at stake. Um, so my mission in the next 20 minutes is to make the two key arguments. Firstly, Taiwan has made important contributions to the US and Chinese um, semiconductor industrial base, both for commercial end uses and also defense end uses. Then I will consider the security externalities uh, for Taiwan. So my main argument is to maximize Taiwan security on the count of semiconductor capability, Taiwan really needs to utilize different formulations of the silicon shell arguments to its advantage. Um, without further ado, 
an overview of the Taiwanese importance. So um, the Taiwanese industrial development in this important industry started in 1970s. And by 2019, um, semiconductors accounted for one third of Taiwan's major exports. And in 2020 through October, Taiwan emerged as China's largest foreign source of semiconductors, accounting for nearly 40% of China's total imports. However, the Chinese chip exports to Taiwan and Hong Kong experienced a fourth consecutive monthly decline back in February last year, with about 30% drop compared to the previous year. This is a quick overview of the Taiwanese importance in semiconductor supply chain. As the existing literature has indicated, um, the semiconductor supply chain has been quite complex. The Taiwanese has uh, basically been the number two key player in terms of the most knowledge uh, intensive um, IC design subsector. In terms of boundary, TSMC has been the world's leading uh, player. It has managed to really outperform Intel uh, to become the leader of process technology uh, many years ago. In terms of back-end test, back testing, packaging testing, Taiwan is number two, number one. How has Taiwan contributed to the U.S. Um, industrial base? Uh, in the commercial end uses, the Taiwanese uh, firms have really fabricated ch chips to support a lot of the IC design companies in North America. TSMC, for example, in 2020, uh, derived about 70% uh, of its net profit from North American customers. In terms of defense use, the Taiwanese has become a trusted um, chip partner for Washington. So in my book, I actually published 10 years ago, I've outlined the Taiwanese contribution by based on the US official data and the elite interviews conducted at the time. So the, the finding at the time was the Taiwanese firms have supported qualified manufacturing list 38535 companies, which are really part of the globalized American defense trip industrial base. In recent years, there are also five major ways in which the Taiwanese contributions to the US defense chip industrial base um, that can be really summarized quickly here. The first one is that the Americans have purchased a lot of the commercial off-the-shelf chips for, uh, for military end uses that are produced in Taiwan. In addition, companies like UMC and TSMC have actually fabricated FPGAs, which are um, a types of very highly dual-use semiconductors uh, that can be used in American defense systems. In addition, foundries in Taiwan have also manufactured AI chips such as GPUs, um, specifically for military applications in the US defense systems. Um, companies uh, in the area of compound semiconductor, such as uh, wing semiconductors, headquartered in Linkou in Taiwan, have, have actually also made contributions of fabricating related compound semiconductors um, that are in use um, for various um, uh, American defense uh, systems. Lastly, um, Taiwan has also uh, managed to fabricate uh, radiation hardened semiconductors that are really needed to perform a various type of, um, sorry, a various type of um, defense uh, systems in the US. One of the major drivers for the US pressure for TSMC to set up a foundry in Arizona is to partly relocate um, its production of military chips uh, to the American soil. And this is really because of Pentagon's dual uh, national security considerations. The first one is the fear that the concentration of high-end chips in Taiwan could render the US vulnerable to a Chinese evasion. The second one is two major problems inherent in the U.S. trusted foundry program that the Pentagon introduced back in 2004. Firstly, um, the scale of this program is quite small and limited because it can only supply about 2% of the semiconductors that the Pentagon acquires annually. The second major problem is that the Pentagon is really unable to influence the related technological development because its demand for semiconductors account for less than 1% of the global total. And this implies that the Pentagon has really been losing access to cutting edge technologies in the domain of semiconductors for end uses in the next generation weapons system. But what about Taiwanese contribution to the Chinese semiconductor industrial base? 
Uh, in my own book, I've outlined um, the three major ways that the Taiwanese contribution uh, to the Chinese industrial base have actually unfolded since 2000, especially measured by technology investment and talent flows. Particularly, the Taiwanese um, semiconductor talents has ar have arguably continuously to really contribute to the development of Chinese uh, industry, despite the recent export controls uh, orchestrated by the U.S. For example, the take of the SMIC, um, currently China's number one chip uh, foundry producer, has benefited from the inputs of various Chinese uh, veteran uh, engineers. In addition, last year, SMIC managed to fabricate um, Huawei's latest chips, uh, sorry, high silicon's latest chips for, for Huawei's next generation of smartphones. And that can be attributed arguably to the SMIC's in-house talents led by a former TSMC season engineer by name of Liang Mengsong. Uh, in a recent interview I've conducted uh, with an industry um, insider, he argues that many Chinese uh, talents uh, continues to uh, about aspire to work for um, the industry across the strait. Uh, in terms of the Chinese contribution to the development of the Chinese defense chip industrial base, I've outlined nine cases in an article published last year. Uh, here, I just wanted to highlight one recent case pertaining to TSMC, and that involves the TSMC's fabrication of chips designed by a Chinese IC uh, um, fabulous house for end users in a Chinese uh, supercomputer. And this supercomputer was actually used to simulate the performance of China's latest hypersonic missiles that were tested back in 2021. So, how can Taiwan try to maximize its national security on account of its aforementioned semiconductor importance? The conventional silicon argument, sequential argument, um, basically uh, are, uh, contends that the Chinese dominance in chip making confers a deterrent against the Chinese attack on Taiwan. The idea is that any wartime damage to the Chinese fabs could actually result in supply uh, shocks. This will then harm the Chinese economy, whose uh, growth has been quite instrumental to the survival of the CCP. Therefore, such an attack can lead to China's self-destruction, uh, given its uh, heavy reliance on the Taiwanese advanced chip manufacturing capability. So how should we try to um, really apprise the aforementioned conventional arguments surrounding silicon child? One uh, perspective is to uh, contend that, well, this argument really makes logical sense because there can be little doubt that China will weigh the effects of a potential war over its semiconductor supply chains. However, um, there are other perspectives uh, contending that the unique position of Taiwan in the global semiconductor supply chain can actually increase the likelihood of a Chinese military attack against the island. In particular, in recent years, some of the Chinese nationalistic commentators, including local scholars, believe that if Beijing can actually nationalize these Taiwanese fabs in the aftermath of a war against Taiwan, it can actually reap the awards of controlling Taiwan semiconductor resources, further denying them to the US. Therefore, they can advocate uh, that the, they further advocate that the Taiwanese niche in the advanced uh, semiconductor making is actually a point in favor of Beijing's use of force um, against Taiwan. However, the aforementioned assertions are quite problematic, and this is primarily because of the uh, problem with the assumption that the Taiwanese fabs can be nationalized and easily put to work producing ships as part of China's industrial base. Because even after, uh, even in the aftermath of a very quick and successful invasion by China against Taiwan, the Taiwanese fabs that are not really uh, damaged by Chinese bombs can actually find it really difficult to maintain operations. Because if uh, the um, semiconductor support of the Taiwanese workers and the uh, equipment and software upgrades provided by firms located outside of Taiwan become absent. In particular, the Taiwanese engineers may already relocate elsewhere to the countryside overseas before the onset of a Chinese attack. Therefore, it will make it really difficult to regroup them to work for these Chinese fabs once they, they fall into the Chinese control. Besides, 
once the Taiwanese, the Taiwan is forced to become integrated into the PRC, the related um, US-led export controls against Chinese entities on the mainland would actually extend to those domiciled in Taiwan. Still others question the um, perspective uh, that the Chinese trip industry will provide a meaningful silicon shield for Taiwan on the ground that semiconductors are unlikely to be a primary consideration for or against Beijing's decision to invade Taiwan. Related semiconductor uh, costs and benefits will not actually weigh heavily in Beijing's calculus regarding the use of force against Taiwan. For example, um, a former co-chief operating officer of TSMC told me last summer, quote, I don't think a single company such as TSMC will become the main reason for a Chinese attack against Taiwan. Similarly, a former CEO of one of Taiwan's leading foundries that I interviewed late last year told me the following, quote, China's decision to make military actions will not be due to Taiwan's semiconductor advantage. Instead, he argues that this kind of a decision to attack Taiwan may ultimately result from Taiwan's declaration of formal independence. Um, at the same time, um, some American scholars have proposed that in the event of a Chinese attack and, against Taiwan, it will be in Washington's interest to basically damage all of the advanced foundries in Taiwan in order to deny the POA access to these strategic assets. Um, if this kind of policy uh, becomes implemented over time, then it will be really detrimental to Taiwan's uh, national security through the elimination of Taiwan's semiconductor infrastructure as its major strategic asset. On the other hand, we can say that the Chinese semiconductor advantage has actually uh, resulted in an alternative and perhaps viable formulation of the silicon shell concept. Namely, this dominance has, has actually increased Taiwan's material agency, VSV China, because it can at least partially um, enhance the availability of partners like this that they cannot sit idly uh, when Taiwan is attacked by China. In the case of the US, the Chinese assets in the area of semiconductors could really strengthen Washington's determination to discourage any kind of potential Chinese military takeover of Taiwan. Um, this is really because losing, losing access to Taiwan's state-of-the-art semiconductor manufacturing capability um, will be really detrimental to the U.S. Uh, defense capability because of the very importance that Taiwan has played in really supplying uh, the American defense establishment of much-needed semiconductor chips. Moreover, uh, Washington acknowledges that despite its effort to establish a domestic chip uh, capability uh, through the U.S. Science and Chip Act, and also to encourage TSMC to establish a foundry in Arizona, uh, these American initiatives are, long, are, are long, unlikely to really uh, replace Taiwan's extensive capacity to fabricate both leading edge as well as legacy, um, age, le legacy chips on the Chinese home soil. Um, other part, third, part, third party countries, aside from the US, would also calculate their own interests when considering whether or not they will get involved in a Quad Strait contingency uh, by factoring into Taiwan's assets in semiconductors. After all, any Chinese military attack can really um, severely affect the chip supplies to a wide range of downstream industries, including AI, 5G. Uh, with, with ripple effects within the border world economy. And one estimate is that related um, uh, economic no loss can amount to about 2.6 trillion. To conclude, um, I have in my short presentation explained to you the Taiwanese importance to the Chinese and also the American um, semiconductor industrial base. And in, to maximize the Chinese uh, national security, I think the Chinese needs to carefully uh, make use of the different formulations of the silicon shield argument to its advantage. Um, even though um, the function of this um, semiconductor, uh, sorry, silicon shield argument can be only partial. I'll stop my presentation here. Excellent. Thank you very, very much uh, for another uh, really great presentation. Uh, finally, I'd like to 
turn over the floor to Doug Fuller, uh, who is Associate Professor of, I believe, something like International Economics, Government and Business uh, at the Copenhagen Business School. Uh, and he's going to speak last. I don't think he has any slides. Yes, I don't have any slides. And that's the title of my department, not, I guess, the uh, International Economics, Business and Government, uh, Government and Business, excuse me. So I guess I will work backwards here to first talk about the Silicon Shield. And thanks to Monique for letting me go last. Um, I agree with the general tenor that from the Ch Chinese calculus, I don't think the chips in Taiwan really are what's going to motivate them as, as the deciding factor of whether or not to, to use force against Taiwan. That's the first point. The second point is fabs are not oil fields. You can't just seize them and rapidly get them up and running in short order, as uh, Monique also suggested. I mean, it's it's not just um, that Taiwanese engineers may flee, which is true. Um, I think more importantly is, as was alluded to in both the other talks, the extensive external inputs that are needed to keep these fabs up and running, just this, even if this machinery by some miracle isn't damaged during <laughs> the said invasion. And remember, these fabs are extremely fragile targets. These are ultra clean rooms that have to remain that way. They have to have electricity supply continuously. So imagine all that somehow by miracle, they emerge unscathed. Rapidly, you're going to need new inputs into all the advanced equipment that is almost entirely coming from the US, Japan, and the Netherlands. It's extremely hard to imagine um, that there would be any resupply um, after, after such an event. Um, and on the Dutch side, they're issue is they don't have much sovereignty in this regard. They have a lot of American technology in their products, so they fall under American export controls anyway. And I mean, even the Vassenaar arrangement has EUV, the most advanced lithography tools, uh, under control. So for the most advanced chips, you need those. That's just not going to be resupplied. But on the... Um, other side on on the US or allied calculus, I would also like to argue that even though many commentators have wanted to make the argument that chips matter, it's not actually, I would argue, a very strong argument. So Erickson Pottinger and a third author I don't remember recently in their piece uh, on Taiwan argued that it would be a disaster if Taiwan was occupied by China. I mean, that is true. All else being equal, we want Taiwan not to be occupied by China. Um, and one of the arguments they floated out there centered around um, semiconductors. They made a tentative stab at the oil fields argument, but I don't think Maybe there was disagreement among the three authors. They they took that that seriously, but they also made other arguments that essentially it would be really bad for the world economy if they couldn't access chips from Taiwan. Again, on the face of that, that is true. The problem, though, is their argument is, OK, so we have to have strong deterrence. And here, I would argue that the link between keeping the status quo of free fl flow of chips and deterrence are not um, that tightly linked. So one, you wouldn't have to occupy Taiwan to block off the supply. 
There could be failed deterrence, right? China attacks anyway, and maybe they fail. Um, it's very hard to la launch an amphibious assault. Maybe they fail, but in this process, it's likely they would destroy <laughs> these fabrication facilities. So there's no Taiwan chips anyway, even in event of that failed deterrence. But I think more of a concern for the rest of the world and for Taiwan are there other means to really uh, make it difficult to supply chips to the rest of the world from Taiwan that are short of a full scale invasion. As these are very fragile targets, China could simply launch a bunch of missiles attacks against them, knock them out. Um, uh, now, is that likely to happen? Probably not. But one advantage of this, it could do it rapidly. There wouldn't be time for much of a uh, response. You'd have a fail complete by the Chinese side. Um, so it wouldn't be clear what the even US response would be, right? It's not a full scale invasion. Taiwan hasn't lost sovereignty. Um, but I think a much more worrisome and less escalatory measure would just simply cut the undersea cables that link Taiwan with the rest of the world. Once you do that, the 68% of the chips coming from US firms uh, to TSMC, those orders, they can't get through. Those firms can't see what's being manufactured in Taiwan. Um, fundamentally, uh, the you know the economy of Taiwan's links with the external world are uh, broken in a pretty substantial way, and in a way that's not uh, the escalation of full military conflict, right? I mean, I actually say that I would argue that scenario is is quite worrisome, um, and and would essentially mean you still have these economic losses from the reduction in worldwide semiconductor capacity. Um, on the overall losses, I think another issue beyond, okay, what should the US or allies do to try to um, VCV chips in terms of deterrence? An another issue is, is just, um, you know, in recent times, twice, in the 21st century, we've seen huge drops in global GDP. And so there are ways to respond to this. This isn't you know, obviously ideal, but if you're a political leader in Washington or Tokyo and your main concern is always to get reelected, um, it's not clear that there aren't alternative responses to um, this cutoff that might still help you get reelected. I mean, if there's a Chinese action, it's unlikely to um, have these others blame for the fallout from, from that action. Um, now, it means there'll be, you know, and so there could be a large fiscal response again, which has been the responses with the global financial crisis and COVID. You're going to have a shift in, you know, what's consumed. Sorry, no more iPhones for a while or very few of them. And then I think the other issue is there's too much status quo bias here overall. Um, Taiwan produces a lot of semiconductors, produces a lot of advanced semiconductors, particularly on the advanced side. That's verging on 100% guarantee that that 90% is going to shrink. Um, it's not just the US CHIPS Act, the Japanese are funding uh, advanced capacity, the Koreans are, the Europeans are. Um, so there is going to be a lot more advanced capacity coming online. And I think the rhetoric around, oh, these foreign uh, industrial policies are going to fail is quite overblown because there's just going to be so much more demand for these chips. It's not 
all of these different countries fighting over just a stagnant pie. The, the demand that's needed out there in the economy, uh, global economy is going to grow. So it won't be that hard to um, make viable projects. Um, furthermore, um, we have to keep in mind what has happened over the course of the 21st century. So the last 25, 24 plus years, um, basically the Europeans, the Japanese, and the US lost relative market share in fabrication. Taiwan, Korea, and China gained market share. One big divider is the former, the losers of relative market share decided for whatever reasons, I, I would argue different reasons in each case, to not heavily subsidize investment in this area. Whereas Taiwan, Korea, and China did decide to subsidize. And so there was this large shift uh, to East Asia. And now that's this is just mimicking the efforts in those places to have some shift back to um, these uh, previous very large centers of uh, chip manufacturing. I also think that um, you know the the rhetoric around um, that these projects are going to fail is sort of based on a false presentation of these other countries have no expertise in semiconductor manufacturing, which is completely untrue. Um, particularly, I would argue the U.S. and Japan. European Union, it's also true, but they tend to specialize in in recent decades in more sort of non-mainstream uh, fabrication processes. But if you look at the United States and Japan, memory production, logic production, they've had that. I mean, the the chart showing Japan and Korea dominating memory production, I don't think that's really accurate if you look at the headquarters of nations. I mean, the it's a three firm oligopoly, two Korean firms and an American firm. Now, Micron, the American firm, has a lot of uh, manufacturing assets in Japan as Japanese companies retreated from that industry. It acquired assets there. Um, so I, I do think this uh, it's quite over blown how, how much we're going to rely on uh, Taiwan for the advanced, most advanced chips. Also, these various industrial policies seem to, uh, in, in many places, moving in the direction of doubling down. Japan's already announced its second tranche of such policies. Secretary Raimondo in the U.S. mentioned, um, you know, given these moves abroad, maybe the U.S. trying to have a second CHIPS Act. And this is even before, let's face it, they haven't really spent very much money of the initial $39 million that was supposed to go into production capacity. They've been, some people would say slow. I would say, you know, moving with all deliberate speed to distribute those, um, those funds. Um, and my final point, I guess I would really want us to look at TSMC as a company versus Taiwan semiconductor industry. Now it's true there are ecosystem effects in Taiwan as as with everywhere else. And again, I think that for other countries argues, well, they should also do public policies to bolster the rest of their ecosystem. But you know, Taiwan is it's the largest Taiwanese chip maker, but there are other Taiwanese chip makers, and there's a huge gap in their performance. Um, so the ecosystem is only, 
you know, a small part of the ex explanatory um, power behind what makes TSM TSMC. I mean, TSMC has been leading in operational efficiency and chip foundry since it was founded as the first foundry and it's continually been able to do so. And probably in the future, we'll be able to keep doing that. Um, that doesn't explain Taiwan's complete failure to develop a DRAM industry, doesn't explain uh, why UMC lags further and further behind, um, isn't even the running in discussion of, you know, what are the going to be the top three foundries? It's going to be TSMC, Samsung, and Intel. Um, so um, I, I, I think we, we, we should not believe that only Taiwan can can do do these these processes. And you know, given how much demand is going to be needed, and and the fact that these various other countries have decided that supply chain resiliency, not just the cheapest, most efficient supply chain, is important, they're going to want to see advanced manufacturing in their own countries. I mean, you could just even look at subsidization as, okay, we're going to you know, pay for part of the cost difference between TSMC and um, these other, other competitors. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you all three uh, for really, really good presentations. Uh, I see questions beginning to trickle in from the audience. Uh, let me remind everyone in the audience, uh, please use the Q&A tab, which I think on most of your screens on Teams will be at the top of your screen between the chat uh, tab and others um, to frame your question, and then we'll try to answer them uh, pretty much as they come in. I have three questions myself, uh, sort of two political and one technical. Uh, and what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll start with one of those and then I'll feather them in amongst the audience questions um, as, as the audience questions uh, roll in in greater number. Uh, first off, I'll lead with the, the first of the political questions, which is that we discussed an awful lot about semiconductors. Um, and semiconductors are obviously very important, um, but there are other things also to discuss, which is a different question. But this question I have is one aspect of this we haven't touched on is how this plays in Taiwanese politics. Right? And I know all three of you are, are experts on Taiwan politics, and I'd be very, very curious to know, what are the political debates around the semiconductor industry, around regulation and subsidies and, and other kinds of uh, support for semiconductor manufacture, uh, design and export? Uh, and also, you know, what are the differences sort of between the parties uh, about this? Is there a meaningful difference? for example, on these questions uh, between the DPP and the KMT uh, or the uh, TPP even. Um, and you know, what do we see sort of emerging from this? Are there kind of coherent policy positions around both semiconductors and technology and trade more, more broadly? Uh, and how does that affect the way that these industries are actually dealt with when different governments are in power? Right. If if we see a transition to a KMT government, would that actually change the way that these these industries work? Um, and also, how much does this impact on Taiwan's foreign relations and vice versa? So, if things become more tense with the mainland, if the U.S. changes its policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan and the rest of East Asia, um, does that meaningfully change the debate in Taiwan around regulation? Uh, or subsidies of the technology sectors. So let me throw that open to all three panelists first, uh, and then we'll move into audience questions before we jump back in some of my others. So if I take the first uh, try, sure. um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't really think that it's a big difference between KMT and DPP in terms of the supporting of the semiconductor if one take into what was the setting up of the Xinjiang Science Park and the subsidy of the TSMC, it was actually under KMT's era. 
And to be very honest, if it's not because of the rather one party status of Taiwan back then, if you could say that was a rather authoritarian period of Taiwan, it would be very difficult for a war island, which was just after the Second World War, a lot of the migrants from mainland to Taiwan to start a very sort of a high end technology at the time. It was a huge debate at the time whether Taiwan was capable or should Taiwan aim to produce the semiconductor, which Taiwan was poor and, you know, like kind of really not at the status. But it was the KMT government and many of the big senior KMT um, technocrats, if you like, to support and look through and to see through what would be established in the initial, initial status or stage of the semiconductor production from the low end. But you got to start from the base. Um, the situation actually gets into more complicated into a democracy because a government can't, in a democratic government, they cannot just to subsidize any particular industry without the rationale. So um, some of my interviewees of the tech company actually complained to me that, you know, to be equality, uh, you know, to get the equal subsidized from the government, that means that any other sectors would be able to compete with the tech sector. But still having said so, I would say that the government's emphasis or attention on semiconductors is overwhelming across different parties. But another point to flip into this discussion or consideration is actually the companies are lots more powerful than the government now in the supply chain. Taiwan as a political government is rather weak, no matter we like or not, in terms of facing the, the geopolitic issue. But the bargaining chips are in the companies. And I use the plural company, not just TSMC, because this production power, the supply chain existed. So they actually has more of the companies bargaining chip than the government in that sense. So my answer to the parties are actually I don't think they would change, but they also didn't have much of the say because if you see TSMC investment in, in the USA, Taiwanese government wasn't really having any weight there. It's about USA and TSMC, right? S similar situation of TSMC in Japan and in Germany. Um, but less from what I would observe. And I think I haven't really answered your second question, but leave that to my colleagues. They would be able to speak more on that. Great, thank you very much, uh, Jingyi. And now, uh, Monique, would you like to pick this up as well? Yes, I agree with Jingyi that in terms of um, bipartisan support for related subsidies for the industry, um, it is quite uh, harmonized over time. But I have to say in terms of uh, technology or talent flow controls, uh, the DPP government has made more endeavors to try to uh, you know, introduce related uh, laws and regulations. Um, however, um, some of these cases of economic espionage and, um, you know, uh, the, the attempts to try to probe Chinese talents or even to hire the Chinese talents in illegal fashion is a very actually difficult to, uh, 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 some of the related legal actions haven't been quite uh, effective in terms of control of the flows. Yeah. Um, yes, go ahead. I chime in? Uh, Jeff, I mean, Basically, I agree with the points made that there's not a huge partisan split here um, and that it's to the extent there is the DPP obviously is more <laughs> anti China than the, the KMT, um, you know, to the extent of doing things like before the brouhaha around uh, technology theft from Micron involving UMC, a Taiwanese company, the DPP government was quite proactive of going after them, presumably because they were 
basically transferring this technology to to China. Um, I, I would say, though, that I think there are um, TSMC is unique. Uh, I mean, it, it's probably true, as Jeannie says, that there's more and more, you know, the quiet politics of business, that the, they're powerful behind the scenes lobbying. But TSMC is in a class of its own. I mean, I've had government officials say directly to me, like, we never talk about them in public because bad things can happen. I mean, TSMC got a minister of science and technology fired <laughs> in the not so distant past. Um, I, I think in longer historical terms, what made Taiwan very different from Korea is Taiwan purposely chose to do a certain type of um, SME-centric industrial policy, and they did not create these enormous chable, generally, these two big failed the companies that had this huge investment veto over the system. Unfortunately, Taiwan's great success in fostering TSMC has created such a company. Um, TSMC does have this huge investment a veto over the Taiwanese state. You see this every time they talk about new new fab projects. TSMC is kind of shaking the government down <laughs> on what kind of deal they're they're going to get. So so there there is um, I think a changing dynamic between uh, TSMC and and the state. I would also add that you do hear rumblings especially among the disaffected young, maybe, about like, ah, oh, why are we subsidizing these fat cats? But it hasn't translated into any partisan divide or policy divide. I think because, you know, ultimately these governments are, are pro-economic growth and see, uh, can't really imagine a way out of relying on TSMC as a big part of that. Excellent. Okay, so now let's let's get into some of the audience questions. Uh, the first one I have here uh, is a bit long, but it, it it's complex. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna read it out uh, to you, which says this is for all three of you. Uh, building fabs to compete with TSMC to diversify supply chains is all well and good, but building a fab is not the same thing as a as building a foundry. Foundries require an IP ecosystem, which makes digital foundries in particular into a natural monopoly. The same dynamic plays out with regard to packaging. I've written a bit about this in the Asia Times, says the questioner. Uh, from a fabless design perspective, customer perspective, a new fab that doesn't have a full IP ecosystem is almost useless. Samsung and Intel have largely failed to put up this kind of ecosystem, uh, which is why TSMC is so dominant. What are your thoughts? about advanced digital being a natural monopoly and the challenges in creating a challenger beyond just building and commissioning fabs. We can go again in the same order in which you spoke if if you want to weigh in. Not all three of you necessarily have to weigh in on every question, but if if you have something to weigh in, uh, by all means, let's do it in, in the same order again. Well then, uh, Michael, thank you for your very informative question. Um, I think TSMC has strategically to, um, should I say, um, collect or attend the IP uh, for exactly this purpose. And uh, this is a reason why TSMC has been not just competing with a cheaper high scale labor and also the tense uh, working culture in Taiwan, but also all that IP license has played a very important role there. And, and I think I remember uh, in one of um, Momoko Kawakami's research paper, she indeed mentioned about TSMC has had a library of the IP and also the solution of all the troubleshooting issues that could have happened during the various complex of 100 more steps. Um, and actually, based on this reason, this is why I personally would think, of course, I also agree with uh, Doc, he just mentioned about now all countries are starting to uh, create industrial capacity, which is true, and they see the danger, but it takes really awful a lot of time and planning. What TSMC and this ecosystem has accumulated is the past 
30 years plans of efforts, regardless where the government is in, the companies and the, the satellite company has been really worked hard to collect all that. And this is what not really easy to be, in my view, to be duplicate or to, you know, to emerge elsewhere. But that's from my own perspective. Yeah. If we if we think about an actual monopoly, it means the you know buyers of the service foundry service can't go anywhere else. And we know even in re very recent times that is not true. I mean, do the does TSMC have an IP ecosystem advantage? Yes, but it's not the barrier of a monopoly, uh, which would be another argument than to you know have subsidies elsewhere to sort of counteract the, this this advantage. So I, I, I think that's a little bit overwrought, particularly when so much of the IP is not coming from TSMC. I mean, I know they do have their in, internal IP, um, but you also have to remember like a lot of design for manufacturing is developed between the foundries and like the leading EDA firms. And to the extent that Samsung and Intel grow their foundry capacity at the leading edge, there's probably going to be much more incentive for those leading EDA vendors to work closely with them. So this is advantage, but I don't see that as a monopoly. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, let me go to the next uh, audience question that I have up here. This one is a sort of complex multi-part question. Uh, the first part basically just highlights the fact that there aren't enough skilled engineers uh, out there uh, in this industry in general, I assume globally. Uh, and then so the, the two-part sort of more pointed question says first, uh, and I'll read this uh, direct from the questioner, uh, how sustainable is the current rate of growth for the Taiwanese economy and how will that impact global security? And the second part is how can Taiwan keep its important international status stroke security as countries like America take on more of the burden of semiconductor development? Right, so, um, well, to be honest, actually the challenging of the high skill manufacturers or engineers is not just a Taiwan issue, it's a global issue, which actually, if you see why that the Silicon Valley are full of designers, but rather than full of engineers, because designers are freer and the profits are lots more. Uh, if you compare to uh, diligent uh, bunny suit engineers who works like 10, 12 hours, um, Five days at least, or six six days per week, and after after the after the fab work, they have still need to carry at least the mobile in case the customer have any questions and to sold out. Um, the trend moving from um, the production labor to the designing labor is a global trend, and it's just from the more privileged country, if I can say, avoid the develop, developing more privileged country to less privileged country, if you like. Now, Taiwan is facing not just of this global issue of what I just mentioned about designer production, uh, it's also facing a serious challenge, which is a low birth rate. Taiwan's birth rate is 0 0.87, if I remember correctly, just a little bit higher than South Korea. And interestingly, South Korea is a rivalry of uh, Samsung, right, of TSMC. So I'm not sure how that can play out of the South Korea's um, uh, high skill workers on that end. But just to say that the challenges are two front. One is younger generation number wise in Taiwan's less and uh, desirable capacity wise, if you could choose, if they can choose, they probably don't want to be high skill engineers in that sense. Sustainability of the human talent is an issue, not for Taiwan, but for all for the skilled production in that sense. And uh, Taiwan also has been 
in in many many scholars' perspective, I would say that not really very wise. It should should have a diversified uh, sector rather than just put all the eggs in one in one basket, which is semiconductor. So, um, for instance, uh, Michael Reilly published a policy paper with us to say that semiconductor of Taiwan is a Dutch disease, that Taiwanese economy just rely on this, probably not very sustainable. Um, but again, we know that it would be a problem. But what can be an otherwise alternative answer, which probably still need to think through or work through on that note. Um, and I think I leave on that. I leave um, uh, Monique and um, Doc to talk more on the uh, American side. Yeah. A brief reply in terms of talent um, issue. Um, I agree with Jingyi that um, talent, um, the provision of skilled talents uh, for the industry um, is quite a universal problem. Uh, but the, the nature of these problems can differ from one country to the other. Uh, in the Chinese case, uh, some estimates uh, show that um, China may need at least 200,000 uh, engineers uh, if China were to you know, achieve the idea of self-reliance in the industry. Uh, in the case of the US, I think the nature of the problem is quite different. It is not only about the quantity of the engineers that are in need uh, to, for example, work for TSMC's uh, new foundries in Arizona. Um, there's also a cultural dimension involved. And I think Morris Chan's um, complaint or, or some of TSMC um, senior executives complaints about the, 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 uh, the quality um, the problems of the U.S. Um, labor discipline issues um, is one thing that we need to watch and see. And this is in particular very important in light of uh, the recent inauguration of TSMC's foundry in Japan. Uh, the Japanese were quite impressive by really finishing the construction of foundry um, a lot more faster than the Americans. And so I don't, I think we need to wait and see uh, to see how this issue of talent plays out, not only in Taiwan, but also at the global uh, level. Regarding Jordan's uh, final question, the final part of his question, um, I really don't think countries like the US are really taking on more burden of semiconductor development. I think this uh, might not be an accurate a description, despite the emergence of various industrial policies that uh, Doc has actually outlined earlier. But in terms of how Taiwan can keep its international, like important international status, uh, this is a tricky question. I agree with Douglas point, uh, Doug, Doug's point earlier about that. Even when it comes to the, the American calculation as to whether or not the U.S. will interfere uh, in the wake of a cross-strait contingency. The American calculation will not only look at semiconductors. Uh, Taiwan is a contested state. So during the case of a Chinese attack, if this issue were to be discussed in front of the UN Security Council, we can imagine Beijing's position, right? By saying this is an eternal affair. And um, so according to international law, uh, third countries like the US even do not have the right to interfere because Taiwan is not really a member of the UN. Um, so this is where I think uh, the, the challenge uh, faced by Taiwan um, is still quite uh, enormous, despite its, um, you know, certain dominant position that it has, some of the firms have played in the semiconductor um, industry. I'll stop here. On the question of talent, um... Yes, it's a global issue. On the other hand, businesses always complain that there's not enough of whatever type of high paid worker <laughs> they're talking about. And we have to remember, yes, in international terms, maybe TSMC engineers are paid less. They're by far sort of the highest paid large group of workers in Taiwan. So um, it's. Um, you know, in, in 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 
domestic terms, it's still a, a very good job. But there is, I mean, I, I do think we can't downplay that Korea and Taiwan are, are entering a pretty severe demographic crisis, um, which is also, you could say, well, globally, the, these trends are afoot, which is also true, but they also are, you know, have no real interest in solving this crisis through immigration, which would be one one solution. Um, and that, I, I would argue, advantages other places such as the US and maybe secondarily Europe, where there's just more immigration period. The, the other issue, and I think this is why, you know, having proactive public policies are good, in this sector is it sends out a signal for people to enter this sector before the chips act or the european chips act what person with any engineering inclination would really want to go into the semiconductor industry on the fabrication side in europe or or the us you would want to do something else maybe in the semiconductor industry but not in, in fabrication it just did not seem like an industry with a future with the amount of um, investment that it's probably going to generate, uh, that changes sort of the calculus of people, like what kind of career path uh, are we considering uh, taking? Um, <clears throat> and, and so some of those people who might have gone into software or chip design may decide, okay, this is about, uh, of you know a valuable and viable career alternative that that they would not have before from any sort of rational uh perspective um and yeah i i do i would also stress that it's kind of hard to take tsmc's <laughs> TSMC clearly does not want to do advanced manufacturing abroad, full stop period. These fabs that they have in Japan and Europe are not designed as advanced fabs and their joint ventures. They suddenly they basically don't matter for TSMC where TSMC makes all its money, which is on, on these advanced nodes. Um, the US Arizona plan is quite different, right? It's supposed to be near the cutting edge. TSMC has never done that outside of Taiwan, not even their Chinese fabs. Um, it has shown no cultural dexterity. Samsung Electronics has operated quite successfully fabs in other countries, including the United States for a long time. Its leading Logic Foundry fab was was in Austin, Texas, um, you know, as as late as the second decade of the 21st century. So, I, I, I think we can't take <laughs> TSMC's strategy, which is basically I don't think they want to build this fab. And here I actually would add on I do think there's a little bit of a tension between the Taiwanese state and TSMC. Not that the Taiwanese state really wants to push all this stuff offshore, but they certainly want to say nice things to American officials who are concerned about supply chain resiliency. Whereas TSMC, they're not even, I think, confident that, um, you know, their internal advantages, they can apply abroad well. Um, so their strategy has been to sort of badmouth Arizona when it hasn't started. Like, it's, I mean, there are some real issues in the U.S., such as building um, takes a long time because a lot of regulations and codes around that. But we have to remember, like, none of the money has been released yet for Arizona. Um, and that's kind of why, <laughs> Uh, you know, they're waiting on these subsidies. And frankly, I mean, the chatter now in D.C. is T TSMC isn't going to get any subsidies, right? There are four big firms vying for a lot of money. TSMC, Intel, Samsung, and Micron. 
And in election year, the two obvious favorites are the American firms, Intel and Micron. And on top of that, if you have to look at sort of past behavior and past commitment to manufacturing in the U.S., TSMC is, you know, a distant fourth. You'd be much better off doubling down on Samsung's fabrication cluster in Austin than giving money to TSMC for a plant it says will never take off and it doesn't want to do anyway. Okay, um, this actually seems like a good opportunity for me to feather in my technical question because it's also about uh, semiconductors and then I'll return uh, if there are more questions from the audience. Um, so the technical question is a little bit sort of out of the blue. Uh, it was that before this panel, immediately before this panel, actually, I was at lunch uh, having a conversation with a couple of people about uh, different strategies of computer upgrading uh, and basically quantum computing being one of them and another possible strategy being essentially stacking up existing chips, GPUs. Um, and, you know, why might somebody choose strategy B over strategy A? Um, and so if in fact it is possible um, to achieve substantial upgrades in computing power basically through amassing enough brute force of fairly old technology or older technology and if in fact the only things that we really need the very most advanced chips for are the really most specialized applications isn't it possible essentially for states that cannot access uh, the very cutting edge chips or leading edge chips being produced by TSMC or others to do a sort of end run around that as long as they don't need to place those chips in the very smallest consumer you know, sort of end user goods, right? If you're really worried about kind of producer goods or back end uh, sort of machinery, servers or, or or other things like this, big computers you're going to use for big things. Does it really matter if you've got a, a three nanometer chip from TSMC uh, or if you've got, you know, 15 or 20, you know, slightly worse chips all stacked up um, and, and it takes just a little bit longer uh, you know, to do whatever it is you need it to do. So certainly from a national security perspective or even from a kind of dominance perspective in the market, is it really a viable strategy just to try to go always for this leading edge? Or might these legacy products that are producible anywhere, including in the main end of China, um, be almost as good for almost everything? And therefore, the, the, the dominance of the leading edge is maybe less important than or, or less advantageous than it may appear. Well, Doc may maybe the, have a different view and that he's really expert because of his own background. So I just throw some stones here because of Jade from Doc and Monique will come. My stone thoughts would be the two faults. Again, different um, pros and cons argument on that. So uh, I don't, so the, the common cool thought is I don't really think that uh, less good or legacy technology can you pack them up can become the uh, advanced technology. I, I I have quite suspicion on that. I don't really think that it it is as that um, the way it is working like that um, because the the small chips has. It's not just about the customer, but also as Monica's research indicates, uh, most of the advanced uh, the, um, military usage of that, which are beyond our civilian usage. So the legacy chips, it's probably not able to do that. But there's another thing. So what I used in my very um, superficial slides was I use the car, right? I use the car saying that there are all the components in car, no matter is electric or non-electric cars needs semiconductor, less big legacy chips. And you are very right, Bill. Actually, China is the 
biggest producer of the legacy chips. And we are now actually focusing on most of the research and debates focus on advanced chip as we just discussed. Um, but we don't really look into the legacy chips, which are left by control, not controlled by the massive produced by China. So vice versa, if China stop doing that legacy chips, subsequently we still need to think and produce or revert back to or to make up that lake of the legacy chips, which again, that's a big expenditure. It's just not many of us were looking at that because we know we can do that is expand more money or more capacity. But the difference of legacy and advanced chip is it's not exactly of pack up more legacy chip can achieve to the advanced chips. But that's what my my stone thoughts um, back for both Monique and Douglas Jade thoughts. You know, let me try to uh, answer your question. Um, the whole I, the whole um, principle in the industry is the most law. So the idea is the whole process leading up to smaller chips through miniaturization process. When it comes to logic chips, um, is that um, the computing power uh, will become larger and larger. Uh, when the process technology advances over time. Um, so uh, if that's the case, um, nowadays, um, say in the arena of military uh, chips, uh, traditionally, uh, reliability of military-grade chips is the most important consideration. Therefore, legacy chips uh, may be more desirable than advanced chips. However, if we consider, for example, uh, the functioning of artificial intelligence into the most modern um, military systems, such as autonomous weapon systems. AI chips, such as GPU chips, will require at least seven nanometer and below uh, advanced process technology. Uh, so if that's the case, it is actually matter uh, for countries that want to uh, really outperform its rivals to try to gain access to the most advanced process technology. Um, so the idea of stacking up uh, legacy chips um, um, with the view that this can perhaps, you know, compensate for the lack of access to the most advanced process technology uh, may actually not work in reality. However, there are other potential uh, technology provisions, uh, say quantum computing um, or uh, some kind of like semiconductors that are not really based on silicon. And, and so uh, the idea is, for example, if China can actually leapfrog in these alternative, uh, you know, uh, technological advancements, then maybe China stands a chance. Uh, but largely, if we talk about like semiconductor based, uh, um, sorry, silicon based semiconductor uh, technological advancement, I would still say gaining access to most advanced uh, process technology, uh, especially for countries like the US and China, is actually uh, very good for the national security. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll, I guess I'll limit, I think the, the brute force processing power argument is an, really an argument about AI processing power. And I, 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 in the short term, sort of with the, um, you know, cutting edge GPUs versus trailing edge GPUs, you in theory can just use a bunch of these trailing edge ones to get a fair amount of AI processing power. But I think as time goes on, um, the performance between these two categories is going to um, in increase substantially. So, so that's a, a large issue for China. It doesn't seem like over time that will be a, a fully viable solution. However, the controls the US has tried to put on AI processing 
chips are, are kind of incomplete. They keep revising them because firms like NVIDIA keep uh, figuring out ways to design towards those tactical controls so they can still sign, uh, sell good enough chips to China. Maybe now they've resolved most of those issues from the point of view of export controls in the US. But there's another, um, there's two other problems. One is um, just sort of gray market. You know, the, it, the world's a big place. Every single buyer of AI chips in the world, are you going to be able to verify that those don't end up in China? No, you can't do that. The counter argument to that is you, you going forward will need so many of these chips that, um, you know, even if you prevent half of what is needed to going to China, then that might be uh, good enough to put a, a fair amount of sand in the gears of China's AI development. The the other, I would say, bigger issue is there's all these offshore uh, offshore cloud businesses which will send uh, rent you access to advanced GPUs, and um, so these aren't based in the U.S. They're typically based in Southeast Asia. Um, some previously were were Chinese owned, but the U.S. has sort of cracked down on. on sales to those firms, but a lot aren't Chinese owned and they're in these third countries. Um, and thus far, they haven't come up with a solution of how to prevent those firms from renting access to these advanced chips to China. And there's a bit of a political problem. You know, does the US really want to uh, irritate Singapore and Malaysia, where most of these uh, cloud businesses are. There's been talk that they will try to crack down on them, but it hasn't happened yet, probably because there are, you know, substantial diplomatic costs to doing so. It strikes me at some point we should have a panel uh, or discussion on cloud farms. Um, and 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 the, this phenomenon in international politics, I think it's one that is rightly brought up here and and not very well understood. So I think we've got one more. Uh, yes, Monique. Can I just at one point echoing uh, what Doc said earlier about the great market um, argument? Um, I've recently conducted a very interesting interview with someone uh, who used to be in charge of. Uh, purchasing SML equipment for Chinese semiconductor company. And he told me that um, to get the equipment, he had to sign the um, document saying, um, you know, his company will never use this equipment to make uh, semiconductors for the end use for the Chinese military. Uh, but in reality, um, he told me that he didn't care. Um, so this is another dimension about this kind of like great market. Of, uh, I mean, about the I think the the problem of these uh, export control uh, mechanisms. But aside from the great market uh, argument, you also have the inability of the American uh, uh, officials literally going to China. Of course, they have the kind of like end user inspection trips. Uh, trips uh, to different Chinese companies. But visits uh, can be one thing, but the reality can be uh, something uh, else. So I think the the core point is about the private firms' interest calculations. For a lot of the American and European, and even Chinese, uh, sorry, um, Japanese and South Korean firms, uh, the Chinese market uh, is enormous. Uh, I have come across instances in which uh, these uh, companies would still manage to try to sell uh, technologies that are banned to the Chinese market. Excellent point. Um, and and that actually is a, is a really good segue into the, the, the final question from an audience member. Uh, after that, and I've got one more question for the three of you, and then I'll invite you each also to, to sort of sum up. Uh, and and we'll conclude. But the last audience question is is a good one on this particular angle, which says, uh, if an invasion, assuming an invasion of Taiwan by China, uh, is what this means, 
Uh, it says literally, if such invasion does occur, but I think it means if, if a Chinese invasion of Taiwan occurs, uh, how effective could sanctions be? Considering that Chinese companies like Huawei, ZTE, and SMIC uh, are still doing relatively well in the face of restrictions already in place. I think it's come into how do we define relatively well, I think. Um, in a sense that actually until 2021, TSMC supplied to Huawei's uh, mobile chips, but um, since 2021, America's export control, especially and first cut, first hit would be the TSMC. They, they say if you want to do business with Apple, you got to say goodbye to, uh, to Huawei. And that, so the TSMC, of course, um, and then we just see, as I mentioned, that two years afterwards, um, Huawei um, in September last year, I think September or August last year, saying that they had a breakthrough on the uh, nano, seven nanometers chips, right? So, yes, if, if we say this is uh, relatively well, then it's probably yes, in a sense that they have no matter how hard the situation they faced, they still had a breakthrough. But it's it's also an unknown situation whether the breakthrough could continue with all the burden they have. So I've been informed by again one of my interviewee in the ITRI saying that the semiconductor this chip manufacturing is like running a marathon, right? So if you imagine that Huawei uh, CIMIC, ZTE, they had really quite a lot of, before the export control, they didn't. They could run and they had a facilitator of the TSMC as working with them because TSMC supplied to Huawei. But after 2021, they stopped and again, increasingly, that Americans see uh, Huawei and the like as a real threat technology wise and put a lot of the burden on them. So how fast they can run and take how long? That's really a big question. And we, I personally do not have an answer on it. And I, unless China has been uh, brewing some alternative way of manufacturing, if again follows what more slows uh, the principle, it would be very difficult for them to continue to break through. But you just never know because in the technology sector, there, there can be a lot of surprises. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, when it comes to the issue of sanctions, I keep thinking about the sanctions that NATO countries have imposed on Russia in the wake of Putin's um, evasion of Ukraine. Um, so I think this is really a huge uh, question, and I'm quite doubtful about a wider range of sanctions that may uh, be introduced against China in, in the wake of a Chinese attack against Taiwan, not only limited to the areas of semiconductors. Um, regarding uh, the latter part of the question about all these Chinese firms doing relatively well, uh, despite the export controls, uh, there are many important issues. Uh, on the surface, yes, SMIC has managed to uh, used semi nanometer process technology to make the chips to to help Huawei right promote its uh, mobile phones but some of my interviews have recently told me that these manufacturings have problems they suffer from uh, low yield they also suffer from elevated costs because it is believed that uh, SMIC has managed to use EUV as opposed to sorry a DUV uh, which is um, a generation lower than the current state-of-the-art EUV equipment to make these chips. So that's question one. And regarding Huawei, it is a fact that recently Nvidia has uh, read, uh, you know, uh, sent out, uh, you know, a document to the U.S. government saying uh, Huawei may be one of the major rivals uh, in the area of GPU uh, or AI-related chip development. But let's wait and see. I think. Um, companies like Huawei, despite its ambition to really um, uh, try to acquire a lot of equipment and talent, 
will still face a serious amount of challenges. Um, so let's wait and see. We have another sem we should have another seminar in one year time. So I mean my my main comment on this is I think people don't really fully understand uh, the timing of the controls. Frankly speaking, actually very solid controls stretching across or somewhat solid controls stretching across Japan, the Netherlands and the United States were not in effect until January 1st of this year. So, you know, a lot of equipment that could be used to make even seven nanometer chip to some degree, whether efficient or not, was available under license in China before this period. At the very end of the last year, the US kind of badgered the Netherlands into an ASML and to stop some orders. But overall, I mean, you can just see, um, I, I didn't bring the slides this time, but if you looked from when the wider biting controls were announced in October of 2022, first there was sort of a dip in sales to China overall. And then once these capital equipment manufacturers figured out, oh, the U.S. is giving out licenses like candy on Halloween, there was this huge spike in sales to China. Um, now, there were various reasons for this. Uh, Japanese uh, licensing did not come into effect until July of last year. So before that, American competitors to Japanese firms would go to the U.S. government and say, look, you can't deny us licenses if you're letting you know Japanese sell there. Um, there were also issues with properly vetting. The U.S. was kind of willing to give mysterious third-party vendors in China a pass, even though those were probably selling directly to the fabs that were trying to build um, advanced tax. But I mean, you know, SMIC or the potential new fab down in the Shenzhen area for semi-advanced, let's say seven nanometer technology, this, the latter one isn't really up and running. They're chock-a-block full of American equipment. Um, and the thing is, a lot of that equipment is illegally in that particular fab in Shanghai, but it's not illegally in China or it's at least in sort of a gray area. But I think going forward, you might have a very different situation, much stricter standards. I mean, I agree with Monique that sort of end user validation is kind of hard to do, but then the solution is they've really changed the technical metrics. So a lot of this equipment, you're not going to be able to sell to China. The, the next five years in China will basically be a question of the equipment we've acquired, can we keep it up and running? If the US government decides that it will still allow, let's say ASML to continue to disservice the equipment, even if they can't sell new parts, it could last as long as five years. And I believe that's from ASML's own estimates. If they can't supply new parts, the time frame for that will be uh, significantly smaller. And on the issue of Huawei itself. So right now it's using this SMIC fab, but um, we have to remember. So in theory, they were cut off in September of 2020, but they just had to get the orders in by that date and they front loaded their orders. So they ordered way more chips than they could possibly use in the short term. And so that also explains um, some of their ability to weather the storm at, at that point. And now it's basically been because the um, controls were very slowly rolled out. I mean, even in December, Undersecretary Estevez of the Bureau of Industry and Security of the Department of Commerce basically admitted their strategy is to let this tighten over time, that as this equipment in China breaks down, that they 
They weren't really. Uh, but uh, even though there was a dramatic announcement on October 7, 2022, they weren't really being extremely strict at that point. And they had to tweak a lot of the technical metrics. So even if we meet next year, we may not have our answer to whether or not um, these are working. Excellent, really excellent. Let me just give you all three my very last question, and then also at the same time, maybe invite you each to sum up uh, your your perspectives on, on everything we've talked about succinctly though, because we only have a few minutes left. Uh, and so my last question is really to move beyond semiconductors. Right? We spent almost the whole time today talking about semiconductors and semiconductors are really important uh, in Taiwan and in the world economy. Uh, but what else is part of the story when it comes to technology or trade uh, and Taiwan? Um, right. I mean, I think you know Taiwan is watching with interest. I suspect what's going on with the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, framework uh, and other kind of multilateral agreements uh, that may facilitate other kinds of trade as well as just semiconductors for Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has a broader economic uh, policy strategy than just export of semiconductors, right? There's all kinds of other things Taiwan is also interested in, in, in exporting. Um, and there are things that Taiwan has to import uh, from certain other places that, that are affected by kind of global politics and, and, and policy. So if, if you'd like, uh, and, and if, if you feel that uh, it's, it's useful, please do comment just a little bit on, on sort of the, the world of technology and trade uh, and security and politics beyond just semiconductors for Taiwan. And then please also just sum up uh, whatever you'd like uh, for, for our conclusion. So we'll go again one final time in the order that, that we had the presentations and start with Jean. Thank you, Bill. And just uh, appreciate it for your last question, which uh, brought me into a wider perspective of not just about semiconductor, but the wider regional uh, geopolitics free trade agreement, for instance, the CPTPP that you just mentioned. Taiwan has been um, applied to join the CPTPP in September, a week after China, I think 2022. Yes, September 2022. And uh, uh, well, the three applicants that more notable three applicants of the joint CPTPP were UK, Taiwan and China and along with the others. Uh, but UK was accepted this year. Oh, sorry, last year, not this year, <laughs> last year. And uh, now um, the watch would be on China and Taiwan. It's a bit um, tricky in that situation. Um, of course, we would want Taiwan would be able to join the CPTPP alone to bring into the the technology uh, production um, strengths into the trading network because the trading network is not just about the trade but also about information exchange, so on and so forth. Um, but we we hope, I hope at least that. Uh, the existence, for instance, the CPTPP regional trade agreement members uh, would be able to support Taiwan in that case, but they face really a big challenging of China. Um, well, uh, how that wind would blow, we don't know. I heard a lot of the suspicions is to to park the Taiwan China issue aside and just wait and see what would happen. But another thought would be actually what Taiwan now is not just what Taiwan was 20 years ago when both Taiwan and China apply for the WTO membership. Um, so it's not China. China has much more powerful than uh, 2020, sorry, 2001. So how does this would pan out? Uh, we don't know, but we we are sure that uh, Taiwan, if it's possible, not only to bring the technology part into the uh, regional trade agreement, but there are much more things that Taiwan would be able to hopefully um, into this agreement, um, regional trade agreement. And I would end here. Um, 
a quick response um, to Bill's question. Um, I think Taiwan um, has a very unique existence in the international system. It is not recognized within the UN, um, but over the past few decades, the Chinese economic power has become a very important explanation as to why Taiwan can really expand its, some of its semi-functional diplomatic relations around the world. So the relevance of Taiwan to the international system as a whole has a lot to do with uh, Taiwan's ability to maintain its economic vitality and competitiveness. So in this regard, I think the Taiwanese really need to continuously expand some of its uh, comparative advantages in other areas of technology, aside from semiconductors. And this can include, for example, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and green energy. So on the question of the economy beyond semiconductors, on the one hand, semiconductors is such a huge part of the economy and, I mean, the most technologically intensive success story Taiwan has. But I mean, I, I do, I mean, I've talked to consultants who've been asked to run like scenarios for non semiconductor related firms. Like what happens if we no longer trade with Taiwan? And there are other sectors in Taiwan. They have a substantial machine tool industry. Um, they tried to diversify their economy through biopharma, and that basically hasn't worked out very well. But there's still, you know, some biopharma activity in Taiwan that it would be inconvenient for uh, businesses abroad to lose. So there, there are broader links that also. Um, would you know impact external actors obviously there would be other economic losses i just think people like to use semiconductors because of the national security implications um uh, and because it's such a you know large part of, of taiwan's um story in this industry on uh cptpp i don't know what i've heard are there certain member states who just are never going to let China in. Um, so that's not going to happen, but that I fully, it makes sense what Jenny said about just tabling it, right? You don't necessarily want it. If you do nothing, it's hard for China to react, but this also has implications for Taiwan, right? Um, it's a little bit hard to let them in. Uh, and and even just do nothing on the the time uh, the Chinese application. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all three. Thank you, Doug, uh, Monique, and Jingyi, uh, for a really stimulating and wide ranging discussion. Uh, it was great to have you, and I'm sure the audience uh, enjoyed it as well. Almost uh, most of our audience actually has stayed with us the entire time. Uh, even though we, we've gone on for a bit long today. So thank you everyone in the audience. Uh, and with that, we'll conclude uh, and good evening, uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. And uh, thank you and, and hope to see you again soon uh, on another uh, event. Bye. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.